everybody, and welcome back to the podcast. We appreciate you joining us again for uh, another segment. Let me tell you what, today is special treat day on the Camino Church Lessons podcast. We have a special guest, and you are going to be blessed by this. We have the Reverend Dr. Hector Benny Custodio, Pastor Benny, Brooklyn Benny. And I say the because there's not another one like you, man. Welcome to the podcast. Pastor Steve, thank you for inviting me. Pleasure. Pleasure. It's our pleasure, man. I'm great to have you here. So as I mentioned, uh, Benny is from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, He is now part of the Camino family. He is pastor of community outreach at Camino. Uh, He is married to Jenny, a beautiful wife. Uh, who will be expecting relatively soon. Congratulations, my friend. Thank you. That is fantastic. Benny uh, has his Ph.D. in urban ministries. He achieved that at Andover Theological School, the first theological school. Is that correct? Yes, Andover Newton Theological School, the first theological school in this country. In this country, Andover. Mm. That's fantastic, which has now been merged into Yale Divinity Mm. School, right? So uh, he brings a whole lot of heft, theological heft, to the conversation. Uh, He also brings a whole lot of real life experience. He is one of the 10 founding members of the New York Latin Kings Street Gang. So, uh, again, a unique and special individual, a brother that uh, I have come to uh, enjoy, learn to get to know and love dearly for not only his faith, but his, his genuineness. So, Benny, we are glad you are here, brother. Thank you. Pleasure having Pleasure being here. Absolutely. So, We are finishing up a series on the epistles of John and Jude, uh, and just kind of as a a quick summary, uh, when we were going through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, of course, you're getting um, all these concepts about bad religion, Benny. Uh, 1st John covers a whole lot of topics about uh, how John is wrestling with the Gnostics. You're familiar with the Gnostics? Yeah, and their their belief that salvation is not really how you get to eternity is that spiritual special knowledge, and all the things that go with that. We get into 2 John, you get these concepts on bad teaching, 3 John, bad leadership, uh, which is still, both are still prevalent, unfortunately, in the church today, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, And then Jude gives us this kind of this theme of bad living. And so what I wanted to do is to kind of summarize and and pull all this together is I wanted to bring Benny in, and uh, I wanted to get his take on a few questions, things that we've wrestled with in the podcast, but uh, some other thoughts that, that uh, we may have and questions we may have. So, Bendy, let's, let's jump into it, buddy. Um, so, when we were talking about Second John, uh, Benny, you get a whole lot of this concept of the grace, mercy, and peace we receive from God. And the idea is, is that we receive that, uh, and it is our blessing, of course, but then we are to reproduce it for those around us now. From your background, can you talk a little bit about both of those, how you have benefited from the grace, mercy, and peace of God, and then what does that mean to you about how you show it to others? Pastor Steve, uh, my perspective on grace and peace, the first thing that comes to my uh, grace and mercy, the first thing that comes to my mind is in the gospel in which there is a young man who has a huge debt, and goes to the person that he owes, and the individual later forgives him from all his debt. But yet, he, in his in his heart full of stone, goes to another person who owes him mm. and doesn't forgive. And I remember that at one time I was in, I was told that I was an enemy of God. Mm. But had it not been for the grace of God, for the mercy of God, I would be here. Yet, in my stage as being an enemy of God. God already saw the calling that he had in my life Mm -hmm. since the beginning of time and covered me with grace. My wife often says, I have, you must, if God had any favorites, you probably one of them (laughs) because I don't know anybody in this world that God has shown so much mercy Mm. and so much grace. And the reason why she said that, because given you have already given a brief breakdown of where I come from, born and raised in East New York, First generation American from Dominican parents. Uh, you know, East New York is actually the hood, what is considered the hood, and being one of the original founding members of one of the most feared gangs in New York City, you can imagine the type of lifestyle I mm-hmm. led back in the days. But had it not been for God's grace and mercy, I would not be here alive today. And if there's anyone who knows about grace and mercy, 
I believe I'm the epitome of that. And when I understood that we that the same grace and mercy that was bestowed upon us, we should bestow on other individuals, regardless if they regardless of the race, creed, religion, or sexual preference, but we have to show the same grace and mercy God showed us. Mm, that's beautiful. So um, for a lot of our listeners today, they're probably already easily picking up on a couple of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it because everything's on the table in this podcast, yes. right, my mm-hmm. brother? We're going to be honest mm-hmm. about it. The Bible uh, says we're open and naked before the God, before the eyes of the Lord. Hold tight. I'm getting ready to get us naked. So, <laughs> so here you are. Um, you have real street credibility mm-hmm. having been part of of the Latin Kings gang, mm-hmm. right? You have gone through the battles. Yes. You spent, was it 20 years in prison? Yes, sir, 20, right? 20 years in prison. For a crime you did not commit. Absolutely, right? murder in the second degree. Right, and you did not do that, and, and you were exonerated, is that correct? Not yet, I'm in the process of that. I okay. was actually released on parole, but okay. the victim's family, um, the, the victim's wife, the victim's mother, their children, they on their own volition, visited me while I was in prison and began. The person who falsely accused me not only ended up being in the same prison where I was at, but right across the cell. Right. And that is the first time that I had to experience the art of forgiveness and show grace and mercy on this individual. Cause, but I didn't know at that time what had occurred behind the scenes. So I had two choices. Either the gangster part of me could have gotten mm-hmm. away with it and murdered him in prison because he actually took and ripped me out of my family's hands. But the preacher side of me saw a lost soul. So as I sat down with the young man who happens to be Dominican, who happens to be a functioning illiterate who couldn't read, he was arrested on the premise of having a, a violating, having a traffic violation. So the corrupt precinct in 115, the 115 precinct in Corona on Northern Boulevard and 93rd Street, for those individuals who are familiar with New York, that was one of the worst and most corrupt precincts mm-hmm. in that era at that time. They told him, if you sign this piece of paper and pay a fine, we'll let you go. Mm-hmm. He did not know that he was signing an affidavit stating that he had witnessed me commit said crime. Wow. Years later, um, during my trials, by, by the way, this and, and this is public knowledge. Is if you Google my name, if those of you, the, the, our audience, if they Google my name, my whole case will come up mm-hmm. on, 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 on Google and everything else that has you know, been attached to my name. The individual not only um, began seeking me, but during my trial, the family, what I didn't know is that the DA banned him from entering into my, my trial. I went mm. through three trials. Mm-hmm. First trial was a mistrial. Second trial was a hung jury. The third trial, I began Monday. I was found guilty of murder in the second degree on Wednesday afternoon. Wow. Sentenced to 125 years to life. Uh, and, and during my time... In prison, um, I had two options, either become bitter and die in prison Mm -hmm. or educate myself and earn my freedom. Mm -hmm. I chose the latter. Mm -hmm. I went from a GED to a master's degree. I'm a proud graduate of the New York Theological Seminary, class of 2007. But prior to that, immediately after I earned my GED, there was a program. They were offering a certificate for a power uh, a certified paralegal certificate, mm-hmm. and I earned my associate's degree and began litigating my own case. They gave me something that is called a modification of time, and layman terms means that, and this is public knowledge again, as I reiterate, at the discretion of the court, unquote, we're going to reduce your sentence from 125 years to life. They reduced it to 33 and a third. Mm-hmm. I continued submitting motions. I continued to bombard the courts took it all the way to the highest court of the country, the United States Supreme Court. They gave me another modification of time. From 33 and a third, they reduced it to 22 years to life. From 22 years to life, they reduced it to 15. I ended up doing 20. So here's what happens, Pastor Steve. In New York, I don't know how North Carolina laws are, but if you are sentenced to 15 years or whatever number they give you, and it has life, the parole board, at their discretion, has the liberty of denying you parole Mm -hmm. and they can continue giving you two years or what we say in New York prison, deucing you two years for the rest of your life. So you have three individuals that you sit before them who have a piece of paper stating the crime that you committed when you were X amount of years old 
Now, after a certain amount of years, 10, 15, 20 years pass, you're not that same person that's written. Mm -hmm. So they sit there for 15 minutes and they decide, they decided that I was not compatible to society. So they denied me my first parole appearance. I went to my second, then on my third, I finally obtained my freedom. The victim's family began writing letters. They began bombarding the parole officer. And I remember my last hearing, the parole officer said, listen, this man went from a GED to a master's degree. He's got an entire school. I, at that time, I had developed a good relationship with Andover Newton Theological Seminary School prior to, me, prior to them giving me a scholarship to earn my doctorate. So they wrote letters of support. The faculty, some of the students in, 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 in school, the victim's family, the mother, the, the wife, they were all present when the crime was committed, December 16, 1991. Mm. And they stated, this man is innocent. We know, we've seen the person who committed this crime, and this was not him. Right. And when they began, when he, I, me, uh, the young man and I began having a conversation, and I was in Eastern Nap um, Napanak, and they call it in Happy Nappy, and they, they have the phones in the yard. He said, come with me. He got on the phone, called the victim's family, because he is the brother of the widow. I spoke with them over the phone. The following day, they came to visit me. And Pastor Steve, let me tell you something. People, everyone knew in the prison my story. The, the correction officers, the brothers that were there in the visiting room, when they saw the victim's family come through, you could have heard a pin drop. Mm -hmm. That family, I will never forget, they ran through the door with tears in their eyes. They started asking for forgiveness. I struggled. I had what is, I, I, at that time, I had an emotional tsunami, if you will. Mm -hmm. There were different emotions of rage, of anger. And then I remembered what God has done for me. Mm. And it, it was like a blanket. Yeah. Remember what I did for you. You should have been dead. Yeah. And I showed grace and mercy. When I hear your story, <clears throat> Pastor Benny, let me, let me kind of highlight a couple of things that, are, that come to my mind. Because I, as a, as a decent podcast host, I've checked online, I've read your story, and mm -hmm. we've talked a lot about it. Yes. When I hear your story, you had a, the first part of your life during that time was just hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's fair to say you probably should be dead. Yes. Right? Uh, at the very least, you should have grown really old in prison if you ever got out. Mm -hmm. Yet, pathways opened up for you that you, you may not could have opened up on your own if it weren't for the presence of God in your life and in the lives of others who created those pathways for you. A lot of grace and mercy in that. Right? So here you are. You are a hard life guy who turned it all around. You are a Latino gentleman who's a minority in this country. Um, I am an older white guy. I don't know your suffering. Mm -hmm. I never had to, never will. I've made my mistakes, but they're because of my bad decisions, not because of where I'm from, what I look like. I think, much like the story of the woman who anointed Jesus' feet, the harder your life has been, the more amazing grace and mercy are. Mm -hmm. When you felt that first moment, when you became a believer, and you begin to see these things happen. Can you describe what that felt like? I am going to have the privilege of turning 51 years old next month, July 12th to be exact. Okay, I had you much younger than that, by the way, in my head. But thank you for clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You have preserved well, my friend. Yes, sir. That's the, that's the grace and mercy of God. Amen. <laughs> yeah, amen. I may be a little bit uncomfortable to look at, but the grace and mercy of God has preserved me throughout all these years. I come from a background, my mother had me when she was 14 years old. My father is an ex-military man in my country. It has up to date. 
I have to hear my mom say, I love you. Hmm. I've never heard those words come out of her mouth. Her actions said otherwise. Mm -hmm. Because she was one of the only individuals that was there for me during my incarceration. When everybody abandoned me, my mom stood by my side. And I praise God for that. Mm -hmm. Her and my little sister. Everybody else abandoned shit. Even my dad. And my father has 18 children. I'm the only one who's named after him. My father and my mom, they were hardworking Dominican immigrants when they came to this country. My father fulfilled his responsibilities as a father when it concerns providing and protecting. But love, those words did not, were non-existent, if you will. When I came to the feet of the cross, when I surrendered my life to Christ, when I allowed God to finally do his will in my life, that is the first time I experienced unconditional love. Mm. My daughter, may God bless her, who just blessed me with a granddaughter, and I have been, it has been the most wonderful blessing in the world. Um, now I am learning what love is. Mm. My wife, uh, she says, you have a difficult time even telling your children I love you. And she's right. I, 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 those words, I have a problem with that because... Given my background, given my upbringing, given where I was grown up in East New York, Brooklyn, and in prison, showing signs of affection and sentiment, sentiment, it was a sign of weakness. But when I understood the plan of salvation, when I understood the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, when I began to hear that song, the Via Dolorosa, mm -hmm. which describes and depicts the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I asked the brother, I said, he did that for me? Why would he do that for me? Mm -hmm. And that's when I first understood unconditional love. And that's when I first experienced his grace and mm -hmm. mercy. When I found out that I should have been I should have been dead since my mother's womb. I'm half blind from one eye. Mm -hmm. My mom had an accident. She fell off the train, um, slipped off the train uh, during a bad winter um, um, uh, season. And from that time, the devil was hot on my heels, mm -hmm. trying to take me out of the count. But God's grace, it, over, it reminds me of the story of Joseph and the hand of God was with Joseph. Mm -hmm. And God was with Joseph. That's only grace and mercy. So I love that part of your story, Benny. Um, and um, I want to get your reaction to this. Um, you, at the moment of your salvation, felt the unconditional love of God. Mm -hmm. Yet at times, as you have just said, it's difficult to always express that. Yes. I would suggest, and I want to hear it from you because you're going to have much more experience in this than me. I would suggest it is easier to express hate than it is to express love. And the only reason we can't express love is because God is love. It's easier to hate people and push them away than it is to draw them in. Is that your experience too or no? What yes. Is it? it's, it's, they say there, there's a certain amount of uh, muscles in your face and it takes too much energy to be angry <laughs> and hateful and bitter and have a face like you sucked on a lemon for years than it is to put on a smile and love a person. When I began to rip away all those masks I was mm. wearing because, you know, as human beings, we tend to wear a mask of whichever way that is our upbringing. We wear a mask. We take a piece from our teachers. We take a piece from our next door neighbor. We take a piece from each sibling if you have any. And we begin to put on these masks. And it's like a layers of onion. You begin to unmask these things. And then you find out that you are the real you. Mm -hmm. You are able to rise above your confusion. And when I saw that, I understood. I'm like, now I, I can give what God gives me. Mm -hmm. And as a pastor, which I believe in my humble opinion, is one of the, the greatest privileges bestowed upon any human being. Because now... We not only have to be transparent and open, but we have to give ourselves. We have to be the epitome of Jesus Christ, the way that he showed us our con uh, the unconditional love. We have to be that conduit that shows the unconditional love to people, regardless of the race, creed, religion, or sexual preferences. Yeah. You know, 
I always tell some some people that want to start uh, you know, spark up of uh, an argument. God didn't appoint me a place in heaven to start condemning people to hell. I, my first experience here in North Carolina, I I, I I remember we did on our first event. I had um, been introduced to the owner of this place where we were doing the retreat, and the first thing that came out of his mouth, "You from up north." I hope y'all don't bring y'all politics down here. <laughs> and I'm like, sir, I didn't come here to win arguments. I came here to win souls. Yeah. You know, so, you know, every day, especially under these unprecedented times, people are dying. I don't have time to be angry, or bitter, or argue with anybody. I have to show what God has shown me yeah. to other people because there are people who are hurting. Mm -hmm. They may not be dying physically, but spiritually, make no mistake, they're dying. Yeah. And who better than us to show the love of Christ to a broken and dying world? I think that fits in so well with especially the, the theology of John, but especially the theology of 1 John. I think that's fantastic. I want to take you to 2 John for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, I'm going to take you to 3 John. Let's go to 3 John. Man. Yes. We, just, we just did a nice little run of First and 2 John. In 3 John, you have this concept of bad leadership. Mm -hmm. right? And you have three characters in this particular story. Uh, you have Gaius, who's known for his hospitality to other believers who are traveling. You have Diotrephes. He is known for inhospitability and and some arguments about the growth of the church at that time, and maybe he was he was trying to place himself in a leadership position. Uh, but I'm, I want to kind of call you out on something, because I, I, I know something that I want our listeners to know, uh, <laughs> and that is uh, you are pretty handy around the kitchen, my friend. Yes, sir. You, uh, yes. You, have a, you have a love and a spiritual talent for cooking, uh, which I think is important in hospitality. So I, I want to ask you this, what role... Do you think that hospitality towards others plays in growing the kingdom? It plays a very vital role because, I mean, as a pastor, as a Christian, as a human being who loves God, I've taken the blueprint from Jesus himself. Every time you see in the Bible, you see that Jesus is preaching to a multitude of people. There are always two things that happen. He deals with the physical. And then he deals with the spiritual. In that order. In that order. Yes, sir. He deals with the physical. If you're hungry, you're not going to hear the gospel. No. You can't. Because no. you're busy thinking about, you're looking at, you're probably looking at, uh, at somebody over there who looks like a good piece of chicken. And your your mind you you ever seen those cartoons yeah. where, uh, and Bugs Bunny when he, the, the, the 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 wolf or, or whoever's chasing the on the the wily coyote and the road runner yeah, he's looking go. at the road runner but he's not looking at him as a road runner he's looking at him like a big piece of turkey <laughs> so how can we bring forth the gospel if we don't deal with those two aspects of life That's right. deal with the physical so I've had the privilege of my mom having me stand beside her. She says, I want you to learn how to cook. I want you to learn how to clean your clothes. I want you to learn how to sew so you don't depend on nobody. Mm -hmm. And if a woman leaves you, you can take care of yourself. <laughs> and I, I sat there and I watched my mom, the way she fed people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, so, it was something phenomenal about sitting with a group of people and enjoying their food. And you, my wife and all my friends and all my family can tell you, when I cook, I don't eat. Mm. I sit back and watch, and after everybody's done, and I see that they've enjoyed my meal, they've truly enjoyed my meal, mm -hmm. that's when I get the satisfaction of sitting down and eating. In the Middle East, there is a beautiful custom. They don't eat with forks and knives or napkins or that. They place a full plate here before you, and everyone joins in and partakes of the meal. And what I found out, and a lot of people may not know this, is that once you partake of that meal, you are family. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus did. Yeah. And then he gave them the bread of life, which is the word. Yes, sir. He, you know, when you, when you think about it, Jesus did so much around table fellowship. I mean, you know, he is called out by uh, the Pharisees and the scribes for eating with sinners mm -hmm. and those who are marginalized. Mm -hmm. but, but he chose, because everybody else is eating with people who lift them up in, in affluence. Mm -hmm. Jesus is eating with people that can't help him at all. 
right? He's given him himself. And I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to take us back to the Gospels for mm-hmm. a minute because I, I, I love what, what you're talking about with food and, uh, and, and how it uses. I want to remind you of, of the story of, of, uh, of Peter when, G, when Jesus is headed to the cross, right? When Peter denies Jesus, <laughs> right? He yes. denies Jesus three times. Well, when he denies him, he is standing around a charcoal fire. Right, mm-hmm. it's one of two places mm-hmm. that charcoal fire is mentioned in the New Testament. The other place mm-hmm. is when Jesus sees them after Jesus is resurrected, and he sees them fishing. They come ashore. He's cooking fish over a charcoal, charcoal fire. fire. Now, can you imagine Peter's emotions? I mean, you know he remembered the smell of that fire when he denied Jesus, Absolutely. right? Mm-hmm. And Jesus is now going to use that same smell to restore. him. I think there's something intimate about food. Absolutely. And I think you have to be willing mm-hmm. to, to share food and spiritual food with people, right, when you need to journey with them for salvation. Because you know as well as I do, maybe even better, Pastor Benny, that uh, salvation typically does not come from Bible thumping. No. It comes from relational evangelism. In fact, Bible thumping has made Jesus unattractive to the mm, world. This is true. It has left a bad eye. I want to. I want to point out. I believe it was two weeks ago. We have the privilege of having an event. At our church. We have a theme during the summer. It's called taking it to the streets. Yes, sir. Meaning that because of the COVID right now, people are not going to church, but we're going to their community. There's a particular community. I'm not going to mention the name because of what I'm going to say afterwards. Sure. Back then, when number 45 was in office, the ice, we would sit there during this property. On, they couldn't go inside this trailer park because it's private property. So as the uh, brothers and sisters from Latin America were going to their prospective employees to work to gain bread and send back home, they rounded them up. And they were afraid. So now this community was afraid to come out. They were afraid to have a go to any church. But Camino, um, we said, we're here. We're going to come to you. So yep. when we went to them, the first thing that we did, we started cooking. I had the privilege of being on the grill. We cooked. We fed at least probably 300 to 400 people at That's that time. Great. Yeah. And, we've, and, and the brothers and sisters... And myself, even Pastor Rusty, and he's mm-hmm. the senior pastor. Yes, sir. He got down and got busy with me on the grill. There you and go. we were feeding everybody. Coming in hot, coming in hot, let's go. <laughs> we'll keep it moving. We have a saying in Spanish, uh, friendo y comiendo, friendo y comiendo. And, and, but the, 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 the love of the people, the understanding that we were there to let them know God has not abandoned you during these unprecedented times. And we are the ambassadors of Christ. Mm-hmm. So we're here to say we love you. We're here to help you. And then after that, then the word came. There so, you go. And then we began ministering. People began questioning. We began speaking to them and letting them know that God is still present. And despite of what the world says, despite of what we're enduring right now, God is still in control. Yes, he is. But food is so it's essential. It is. It's in, it goes hand in hand with ministry. You cannot do ministry mm-hmm. and not share a, a, a piece of bread with another individual. There's something special and divine about combining the food entangled with the word of God. And at the end of the day, he is the bread of life. I, and I think that's why I, I am 100% with you there, Pastor Benny. And I think that's why he chose that as one of the images for who he is. Yes. It's because he understood the intimacy right, of mm-hmm. bread. Man, I want to jump to, to the book of Jude for a second. And we're really just kind of expanding our discussion mm-hmm. just a little bit further because all this is rolling together, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, your experiences tie so well. But when you get into the book of Jude, you get into this concept of bad living, right? Bad living based on our faith and how people need to come around and, um, and live what they believe, not believe and live differently. And I want to ask you this because it really fits in with what you were just wrapping up on, Pastor Benny. And that is when, how, how would you describe or talk about or, or relate to sharing the grace, mercy, and peace of Christ with others, journeying with them, who, with others who are not believers. How do you live with them but don't approve of or condone their improper lifestyle? You got any thoughts on that? 
I have several thoughts on that. I want to make a quote from Bob Marley. He said, "Oh wait, uh, one of my favorite philosophers. <laughs> I hear he sings too. <laughs> oh my gosh, one, I love Bob the, Marley. He says, religion is man's attempt to be as powerful as God. Wow. And we have embraced the cloak of religiosity, mm-hmm. if you will. And we believe that, you know, we're so heavily bound that we're no earthly good. And when it comes to bad leadership and not compromising your faith, but yet walking with the world, you have to remember that first time that God loved you, that you understood. Because at one time, you were like them. The Apostle Paul gives his, uh, his resume when he begins to bring the gospel to the, the people. He says, I was the chief of sinners. Mm-hmm. And he begins to give you a breakdown, a complete resume, and an extravagant resume of the chief sinner that he was, but had it not been for God's grace. And he remembered that. And that remembrance brought him to a point in which he can show the same to others without compromising his faith. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with me. A person asked me the other day, what is your stand on X, Y, and Z? I said, I've been been an adulterer. Mm -hmm. I've been a fornicator. I've been a drunkard. I've been a liar. I've been a thief. I've been all of those things. And yet, I have no reason to judge anyone and look at them differently. Because on the seventh day when God rested, he cre- he, when he created the world in six days, rested on the seventh day, he said everything was good. Good. Yep. Our problem is that we're good. I wholeheartedly believe that we're good people that make bad choices. Mm. But because of our bad choices, it does not define us who we are in the eyes of God. And it shouldn't define us in the eyes of those of us who claim Christ rules and abides in our heart. We have no reason. God didn't, didn't appoint us to be judge and jury to condemn anyone. Right. And we should always remember our humble beginnings, how God saved us when we were described as enemies of God. And that is bad leadership. Once you, know, you have churches and certain people and certain pastors or certain members of church who believe that because they have received Christ, I've arrived to that plateau. Mm. No. Mm-mm. No, Jesus was never like that. In mm-hmm. fact, Jesus was humble. Yep. And he humbled himself and came here to serve and not be served. Absolutely. Yeah, that's just the beginning of your journey, right? Yes, sir. And I, I think your reference to Paul is great because, you know, Paul said, be in the world, not of the world, right? Paul, Paul never walked away from, from journeying with whomever was around him. But he also did not go back to his old ways that were founded on worldly values and priorities. Right? And, and you alluded to this earlier, you know, life's priorities for believers are is God is first, and then it, he'll take care of everything else. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't have to have 10 priorities. We got one. That's it. God orders everything else. Absolutely. Right? Uh, I, I love it. I think it's beautiful, man. And I, I appreciate what you bring to the table because talked about earlier um, you have lived a life so far and will continue to live a life that allows you to have a perspective that is unique right I can't have that perspective my my journey is different than yours Mm -hmm. Um, and I love hearing your story and your journey and how you truly can't help but to love the people around you because God couldn't help but to love you and you know probably far better than most of us, that you didn't deserve that love at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't. None of us do. Nope. But you know it in your gut. You know what I'm saying? The Bible says we've all, not some, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's right. And you talked about early on in the podcast today about you were told that you were an enemy of God. Uh, And that is a very true theological statement. Not an enemy because God despised you, but an enemy because you weren't with God. You know, it's you know, it's real clear in Scripture. Either you're with God or you're an enemy it. of. Mm-hmm. You love God or you hate God. There's not an in-between. There's no in-between. And those aren't emotional statements. Those are relational statements. Yes. Uh, and I think you are a great demonstration uh, of that. Man, I, I, a couple of things. One, I love you, <laughs> right? And, and I love you because of who you are, but I love you mostly because you are a child of the King. Yes, sir. Um, and, and your ministry is so great. 
I want to go ahead and say, now, I want you back sometime, man. We're going to be doing some other stuff. I think you can plug in real well. I'd love to have you back on the podcast. Pastor, it will be my privilege to be here. Fantastic. So thank you, Pastor Benny. Uh, let, me, let me end it as formally as I started. Thank you, <laughs> Reverend Dr. Hector <laughs> Benny Custodio, Pastor Benny, Brooklyn Benny. Uh, it has been fantastic having you. Everybody, look, we, we've wrapped up this series, and, and like I told you, today was a treat. What a great way to wrap up the study of the epistles of John and Jude. Next, we're jumping into the parables of Jesus. What a great series that's going to be because Jesus did so much and taught so much through those parables, and they are still so valuable today. So we'll have some great guests on that round, too. Looking forward to it. Until we see you again. Stay in the Word. Let's keep this journey going. Thanks a lot.